Psychology 101 Lecture 4. Hello students. Today we're going to look at something really, really interesting, and that is the element of called carbon. Carbon is the backbone of life. And why do we say that? Because all life as we know it, which is unfortunately from just one sample, which is the Earth, um, it is all of it, all life is carbon based. Um, life as we don't know it, we wouldn't really know, and we can maybe conjecture, but uh, we don't have any solid proof. The only proof we have is life on Earth, and all life on Earth is mostly carbon based. Um, it is um, formed from carbon. Carbon is the backbone of all life, of all the compounds of life. And uh, it is because carbon has this amazing ability to form large, complex, and varied molecules. Um, all our molecules, proteins, DNA, carbohydrates, etc., they all the ones that are biomolecules that distinguish living matter are all composed of carbon compounds. And that's because if you look at the carbon atom itself, which would be this nice big black ball in the center of the picture. That has um, around it, um, whirling around madly on the second shell, are four electrons. So uh, although the valency is eight, it has half the complement of the electrons it needs to get to the noble gas configuration. So at this point, um, every element that it bonds with uh, will uh, be very attractive because each electron in that outer shell will exert an equal pull from the nucleus. So a whole bunch of molecules are possible to be made. In fact, there's a whole discipline, a whole branch of chemistry called organic chemistry, and that's devoted to studying compounds that are made out of carbon. Organic compounds uh, can be simple molecules, and they can go all the way to being colossal ones. More, most orga organic compounds contain hydrogen atoms in addition to the carbon atoms. That's like a really nice combination for carbon. Um, uh, hydrogen happens to be the most abundant element in the universe, and so um, carbon being one of the nice ones, it likes to bond with it a lot. Stanley Miller actually did this experiment um, some time back, and he wanted to dis demonstrate that if life started on Earth in um, a shallow pool, um, which was sheltered, then uh, we do need to have the basic biomolecules to start life with before we can have a cell. Uh, with a membrane and information that is handed down from generation to generation in the form of nucleotides. So before we can even get to that, we have to start with the building blocks of the biomolecules. And uh, that was why he thought, well, maybe um, we can demonstrate that uh, the building blocks didn't just show up. Um, they were actually synthesized by natural processes that occurred in the Earth's atmosphere uh, that was existing at that time. So that atmosphere would be the second atmosphere of the Earth. And um, although we can get carbonic uh, carbon compounds um, from volcanoes, which were very active in those days uh, in early Earth, uh, however, uh, he did this a classic and elegant experiment where um, he took, he simulated the sea in a beaker and, and uh, just m made it hot and got water vapor, which simulated the atmosphere. And this atmosphere is the reducing atmosphere, so it has methane, ammonia, molecular hydrogen from the first atmosphere. And um, he um, charged it with electrodes, a sim that would be a simulation of electricity. So electricity delivers an awful lot of energy. And if you can um, collide these molecules and um, give them a jolt of energy in the form of electricity, they would actually combine. And so um, he combined them, and then he condensed that um, as rain. Um, and then he collected all these molecules to see what did he get 
from simple molecules like methane, ammonia, and hydrogen, what does he get? And what he found was that he found uh, amino acids, um, he found simple sugars, he found these amazing molecules that um, can come from uh, just those precursors. So uh, then it became a, a, um, a sort of a leap uh, from there to the next thing, which is an actual cell. It wasn't such a great big leap anymore. It was more like, well, this is possible. Um, and that was because we have this amazing element called carbon. And it can bond to four other atoms. And its electron configuration will actually de determine what kinds and what number of bonds it will form uh, with the other atoms. So um, carbon will make um, covalent bonds because it needs four more to get to the noble gas configuration. So it's not going to um, run off uh, and become an ionic compound. And it won't um, form a polar covalent bond either. So this is very useful because uh, with, with uh, an element like this, um, you can come up with a lot of possibilities. So in molecules with multiple carbons, each carbon then can be bonded to four other carbons. And you would get a tetrahedral shape. However, when there are two carbons and they're bonded by a double bond, um, the atoms joined in the carbons are on the same plane as the carbons. So let me show you what that means. So over here we have a molecule. The first picture is uh, a picture of methane. Methane has the carbon molecule in the center and four hydrogens around it, bonded to the four electrons of carbon. And so it is a beautifully symmetrical um, molecule, and um, it is depicted uh, on the very top of the slide. Then we have something called ethane. And in ethane, um, what we have is uh, uh, two carbons that are bonded uh, to six hydrogen. And again, they're covalent. They're all shared. Um, however, the carbon-carbon bond is shared, uh, is a stronger bond than the carbon-hydrogen bonds. Okay, so then at the bottom, there is the compound called ethene. And here we have a double bond between the two carbons because we only have four hydrogens um, in this molecule. And so if you look at the picture, uh, the ball and stick model first, you see that all the hydrogens are on the same plane as the carbons. Um, and if you look at the space filling model, it looks the same as uh, the ball and stick model of ethene. Whereas if you compare it to methane and ethane, the hydrogens form tend to form tetrahedrons. So um, because of this electron configuration, um, the covalent compatibility, uh, compatibility is, is pretty diverse. Um, the most frequent partners of the covalent bonds for carbon are hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And these are actually the building blocks of uh, living molecules. So um, here is a depiction of hydrogen, valency of one, oxygen, valency of two, nitrogen has a valency of three, and carbon has a valency of four. So you can see how they are increasing um, from one to four in complexity and how they are very well matched uh, to bond with, with a carbon. Oops. Um, w carbon doesn't have to bind with just hydrogen. That I just want to make that clear that hydrogen isn't the only thing it binds with. Uh, carbon can partner with other atoms. For example, it can partner with oxygen. And you get carbon dioxide. And when it partners with carbon dioxide, dioxide means two oxygens. And carbon actually needs four partners. So it's going to make two double bonds. So carbon dioxide is a very stable molecule. Um, or it will partner with um, ammonia and uh, in a reaction which is carried on in the liver. And it will form urea. 
And as you can see here at the uh, bottom of the page, there is a depiction of urea with carbon double bonding with oxygen and then making single covalent bonds with nitrogens um, and the nitrogens on their other, um, because they too need to satisfy their valencies, they're bonding with hydrogens and then, of course, carbon. Carbon-carbon um, skeletons form the backbone of most organic molecules. So uh, carbon, since it can bond with, each, uh, with another carbon and another carbon and yet another carbon, the chains can vary in length and shape. Um, you can have straight chains of carbons. You can have branching chains of carbon. You can have carbon rings. You can have double bonds. You can have single bonds. There's just an endless amount of variation with uh, the skeleton that you can make from a carbon-carbon um, compound. And here we are. Um, this is what I mean by that. So the bond uh, can be in one plane. So as in ethane, uh, you would have just, you know, um, hydrogen bonds. Um, you can have propane also. That's three carbons. Ethane is just two. Um, you can have uh, butene, and anytime there's an ene, that means there's a double bond present. And you can see the presence of the a double bond in butene, in one butene and two butene, which is um, um, the same compound, except the double bond is switched. Um, or you can have a branching compound, and instead of... Um, uh, butane, you could have something called methylpropane or isobutane, where the carbons are actually branching. Or you can have carbons in the form of a ring, as in hexanes, in, like benzene, for instance. Um, benzene has three double bonds um, between six carbons, and um, it, is a, it forms a ring. Um, cyclohexane has no double bonds, um, and, but it does have six carbons, and that too forms a ring. So those are very interesting compounds. Um, so here we are going to uh, look at the same picture one more time, but this time a little bit more detail. So ethane, um, the carbon bond is in one plane. Propane, again, three carbons lined up and in, a, in one plane. Or you can have them branching. You can have the carbons branching, uh, as in this picture. Or you can have double bonds put in, or you can have uh, the carbons in a form of a ring. Hydrocarbons are organic compounds cons consisting of only hydrogen and carbon. So that's why they're called hydrocarbons. Uh, many organic compounds, like fats, have hydrocarbon components to them. Hydrocarbons can undergo reactions that release a large amount of energy. Isomers. Isomerism is a very interesting characteristic of um, carbon compounds. It's, it's, uh, it's just really, really cool. What, of, of course, we have to define it first. An isomer is a compound um, and isomers would be compounds that have the same molecular formula, but they have different structures. How cool is that? So the formula is exactly the same. So the number of carbon atoms or hydrogen atoms or whatever number of atoms they have, they're exactly the same. And you would think that it wouldn't matter uh, where the bonds are, but it matters a lot. So w you get different structures and you get completely different properties just by moving bonds around. Um, so there, there's three types of, of uh, isomers. One is a straight structural isomer where um, you have the exact same formula for both compounds, but the covalent arrangement bonds are in different arrangements. So they're, they're um, you know, instead of like the first carbon, um, maybe the substitute group is, is bonded to the third carbon. And that just changes the, the spatial arrangement of the molecule. It looks different in 3D space. And it also will act differently. So that's the first and the simplest kind. Um, then there are isomers that are called cis-trans, where they have the same covalent bonds, um, the same chemical formula, but 
the bonds are arranged in different spatial arrangements in a different way. So uh, it, when we say cis, we always know that this, the groups are on the same side. And when you say trans, we always know that the groups have been swapped out and they're on the opposite side. So I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And then the third type is enantiomers. Enantiomers are isomers that are mirror images of each other, which is very, very cool. So let's look at all of these um, separately. Whoopsie. So uh, this is a pictorial representation of the previous slide, which was just in words. So if you look at the first picture, the very first structural isomer uh, diagram, and you see these dark black balls and little gray balls. And if you just look at the dark black balls, because those are supposed to be the carbon atoms, um, you see this uh, nice staircase arrangement of them. But if you look at the right-hand side, um, that same number of atoms are, are there, it's the same chemical formula. But now, the carbons are not arranged in a stepwise fashion. In fact, they're arranged in some sort of like a triangle sort of thing. So there's something else going on. So that makes it a, a different looking molecule. And so therefore, it will have different properties. Um, and then if you look at uh, the middle picture where the cis-trans, that's a representation of cis-trans isomers. So the one on the left, which has um, two carbons, as you can see, they're double bonded in the middle, the little, uh, the big black balls. Um, and then you see it attached to them uh, are red balls and gray balls. Well, um, the first compound is is called trans because uh, the red balls are one is on one side and the other one is on the other side whereas the second compound that you see on the right um, has both red balls on one side so that's called the cis arrangement uh, which is kind of cool and of course as you can see, this looks like a completely different molecule, and of course it will have different properties. And then the last um, type of um, handedness or chirality or isomers are the ones at the bottom, and those are called enantiomers. And uh, enantiomers are mirror images. So if you look at the carbon atom, which is the central black ball, you see that every bond is attached to a different uh, atom. So red could be oxygen, and blue could be hydrogen, and could be I don't know, something else. And uh, and so the gray is also something else. So they're all different compounds and completely different atoms attached to that one carbon because carbon, of course, can have uh, make four covalent bonds. Um, but when you look at them, the the length of the bonds are, are different because the atoms are different. So um, some bonds will be short because the atoms are closer together. Um, the others, they're really big atoms, so they'll be farther apart and so on. And when you look at uh, the same picture on uh, the right-hand side of that compound uh, for the enantiomer, what you see is a mirror image. So when you look in the mirror, um, when you see something, it's actually the reverse of, of, of what you're actually looking at. And so um, that is what an enantiomer is. It is, um, uh, sometimes it's pronounced enantiomer, uh, but it doesn't really matter what it's uh, pronounced as. Um, you just need to know uh, that these are mirror images. And let's look at them a little bit more detail so it makes it a little bit more clear as to what exactly are these. Um, there is an example on the top of the slide called structural isomers. And here we have, we, remember we were talking about how the bonds, um, it's the same chemical formula, but maybe the bonds are in different places. And uh, the first compound you see on the left at the very top, you see pentane. So pentane means five carbons. And so it's a strand of five carbons and all the valencies are, are uh, satisfied. Um, it has all those hydrogens attached to it if it's not attached to a carbon. So um, that's a pentane. Kind of cool. Straight. But then if you look at the compound next to it, it still has five carbons. It still has the same number of hydrogens. But this time 
carbon number two is actually attached to um, three carbons, not two carbons. And um, so it is uh, exactly the same. It's the exact same number of carbons, exact five carbons, exact same number of hydrogens, but a slightly different arrangement of bonds. And so this is no longer pentane. It doesn't act like pentane. It doesn't behave like pentane. In fact, it's called 2-methylbutane. So uh, that is by just shifting around one carbon, uh, you get a completely different compound. And then uh, the cis-trans isomers that we looked at in the previous slide. Uh, cis, uh, if you can look at them, uh, the little red, uh, sorry, blue Xs, those are our substitute groups. And so they're both on the same side, OK? Um, trans means that the substitute groups are on opposite sides instead of the same side. And because that bond is flipped, it, this compound will then have different properties. Um, so that's a cis or a trans isomer. And then uh, at the very bottom of the slide, what you see is uh, enantiomers. And, um, and these are mirror images. So like our hands, our hands are, are, are mirror images. You can't actually, no matter how you twist them around, you can't superimpose them on each other. They're not identical. Um, they're, they're mirror images. So if you put your thumb on top of uh, uh, the other hand, it lands on the pinky. It doesn't land on the thumb unless you turn it around and then uh, the two palms are touching, but that's not the same. So uh, when you look at, so th those are mirror images. Uh, hands, feet, these are mirror images. Um, so same thing with the other compounds. They can be mirror images, which means that uh, the bonds are, are flipped around and so you end up with two different compounds, even though the number of hydrogens, oxygens, whatever chemical formula it is, is exactly the same. It's just that the bonds are moved around, and um, that determines its new properties. And so we always call them left or right. And uh, just like left hand or right hand. So there's an L isomer or a D isomer of the same chemical, um, which makes it very cool because life actually um, selects either the L or the D. And we're going to check that out in, in uh, the next slide. So here we have um, isomers like starch and cellulose. OK, so uh, cellulose uh, and starch, both plant compounds, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're both made out of glucose, or repeating units of glucose. The monomer is glucose. And what you see is um, a starch is, is um, uh, in helico. It's more like a helix, whereas cellulose is a straight um, a chain, and it's very fibrous, so uh, you can't actually digest it, whereas starch, uh, we do have enzymes that will break that down. And that's because the bonds are, are different. And if we um, look at the next slide, um, you can see that a little bit better, whereas cellulose is just a straight structure, whereas starch is more coiled. And it is because the bonds are flipped. And um, uh, we, we, uh, because the bonds are flipped, we can't digest cellulose. It just passes through us, which is awfully cool because, hey, by flipping a bond, you can change properties completely. Here is another isomer. Um, so here is a compound, and um, it's c if if it's the right-handed enantiomer, it's called limonene, and uh, you smell something that is more like an orange. Uh, but if it's a left-handed um, limonene, then what you smell is a lemon smell and not an orange smell. So by flipping the bond or looking, using the mirror image, uh, you're actually smelling two completely different smells. So um, if you look at uh, the, the uh, uh, notation, the, how they're trying to depict the bond that's uh, either the front or the back, um, it's either dashed or it's solid. And so that just shows you that it's in the right hand form or the left hand. S is also stands for left. Um, another example that which is common is naproxen, which is something that we actually use. Uh, people use it for 
um, anti-inflammatory agents, you know, if there's swelling or whatever, um, they'll take naproxen, sort of like aspirin. Um, and if you look at the bond, if you look at the compound itself, uh, the left-handed form of naproxen is, is uh, uh, you know, just a nice couple, two benzene rings fused together and uh, some substitute groups. Uh, but if you look at the right-handed form, so we're just flipping the bonds around, and that's a mirror image. It's the exact same chemical formula, exact same shape, but the bond is flipped, so the big old um, substitute, which was on the right-hand, um, um, sorry, the uh, left-hand side is now the CH3O is now on um, the right-hand side, and that's actually a liver toxin. So it will kill you. That will uh, destroy your liver if you take the right-handed form of an aproxin instead of the left-handed form. So we have to be kind of a little bit careful about what we're doing here. Um, uh, same thing with uh, ibuprofen, which just about everybody has taken. So the right enantiomer is relatively inactive, um, whereas the left enantiomer is 160 times more active as a painkiller. And so you can see by just uh, having a mirror image of the same compound, um, uh, something is up. So again, it's uh, the CH3 bond, which is just uh, flipped. And uh, so what we have is something that is, won't work and something that will work very well to get rid of pain. Um, so uh, there are other isomer pairs. Uh, for instance, lactic acid, which is a carboxylic acid, it's found in sour milk. All right, uh, and it's also found in the blood and muscle fluids of animals. So uh, we can tell right away that this lactic acid is in sour milk doesn't do the same stuff as the lactic acid in blood and in muscle fluids of uh, of animals. So um, that's because they're isomers. And another uh, product called Carbone, um, it's pretty well known. Uh, it's used in spearmint bubblegum, and it's also used uh, in caraway seeds. So again, it's the same uh, physical, uh, the, the, the same carbone, it's the same exact thing, but it's a mirror image. And the odors of the two carbones are completely different. That means caraway seed smells nothing like spearmint. So, um, uh, j and that is a, a property of um, being an enantiomer. So going over it once more, cis means uh, this side uh, or same side, and trans means other side or opposite sides. So cis isomers have the substitute groups in the same direction, and the trans isomers have substitute groups in the opposite directions. And these tiny changes um, endow different properties. They are different boiling points. They have different melting points. They have different polarity. They have different dipoles. So uh, completely different. And uh, this leads us to chirality. So chirality is uh, the same idea as uh, mirror images. In fact, uh, it is a property of um, uh, enantiomers, uh, and uh, chirality is, is exactly that. It is a property of asymmetry. So a molecule is chiral if it's not identical to its mirror image. That is, it cannot be superposed onto it. Um, so uh, if um, a chiral object and a mirror and its mirror object image um, are a pair, then those are called enantiomers. And it applies actually to objects as well as molecules. And let me see, um, there is this nice website which actually, uh, uh, it's a YouTube video, and he actually talks about this in a really good way. I don't know if I can bring it up, but let's try and see if uh, this shows up. Oh, it did. What do we know? Okay, so... Um, if I were to draw a hand, let me just draw a hand really fast. So I'll draw a left hand. It looks something like that. That is a left hand. Now, if I were to take its mirror image, so let's say that this is a mirror right there, now I want to take its mirror image. I'll draw the mirror image in green. So its mirror image would look something like this. 
looks something like this. Not exact, but you get the idea. The mirror image of a left hand looks a lot like a right hand. Now, no matter how I try to shift or rotate this hand like this, I might try to maybe rotate it 180 degrees so that the thumb is on the other side, like this image right here. But no matter what I do, I will never get, be able to make this thing look like that thing. I can shift it and rotate it. It'll just never happen. I will never be able to superimpose the blue hand on top of this green hand. When I say superimpose, literally put it exactly on top of the green hand. So whenever something is not superimposable on its mirror image, let me write this down. So this is not, this is not superimposable on its mirror image. Mirror image. We call it chiral. We call it chiral. So this hand drawing right here is an example of a chiral object. Or I guess the hand is an example of a chiral object. This is not superimposable on its mirror image. And it makes sense that it's called a chiral, it's called chiral, because the word chiral comes from the Greek the Greek word for hand. Greek Greek for hand. And this definition of not being able to be superimposable on its mirror image, this applies whether you're dealing with chemistry or mathematics or, I guess, uh, just hands in general. So if we extend this definition to, to chemistry, because that's what we're talking about, there's two concepts here. There are chiral molecules, chiral molecules, and then there are chiral centers or chiral well, I call them chiral atoms. They tend to be ca carbon atoms, so sometimes they call them chiral carbons. So you have these chiral, and then you have chiral, chiral atoms. Now, chiral molecules are literally molecules that are not superimposable on their mirror image. So, not, I'm not going to write the whole thing, you know, not superimposable, well, I'll just write the whole thing, not superimposable on mirror image, mirror image. Now, for chiral atoms, this is essentially true, but when you look for chiral atoms within a molecule, you're, the, the best way to kind of spot them is, that, is to recognize that these generally, or maybe I should say usually, usually are carbons, especially when we're dealing with organic chemistry, but they could be phosphoruses or sulfurs, but usually are carbons, are carbons bonded to four different groups, four different, four different groups. And the, I want to emphasize groups, not just four different atoms. And to kind of highlight a molecule that contains a chiral atom or a chiral carbon, we can just think of one. So let's say that I have a carbon right here, and I'm going to set this up so this is actually a chiral atom, that the carbon specific is a chiral atom, but it's part of a chiral molecule. And then we'll see examples that are one or both of these are, are true. So let's say it's bonded. Let's say it's bonded to a let's say it's bonded to a methyl group from that bond. It kind of pops out of the page. Let's say it's there's a bromine over here. Let's say behind it there is a hydrogen, and then above it we have a fluorine. Now if I were to take the mirror image of this thing right here, we have your carbon in the center. I want to do the same blue. You have the carbon in the center, and then you have the fluorine above the carbon. You have your bromine now going in this direction. You have this methyl group. It's still popping out of the page, but it's now going to the right instead of to the left. So CH3. And then you have the hydrogen still in the back. These are mirror images, if you view this as kind of the mirror, and you can see on both sides of the mirror. Now, why is this chiral? Well, no matter, and it's a little bit of a visualization challenge, but no matter how you try to rotate this thing right here, you will never make it exactly like this thing. You might try to rotate it, you might try to rotate it around like that, and try to get the methyl group over here to get it over there. So let's try to do that. But if we try to get the methyl group over there, what's going to happen to the other to the other groups? Well, then the hydrogen group is going, or the hydrogen, I should say, the hydrogen atom is going to move there, and the bromine is going to move there. 
but this has the bromine in, so this would be superimposable if this was a hydrogen and this was a bromine, but it's not. The, you can imagine the hydrogen and bromine are switched, and you could flip it and do whatever else you want or try to rotate in any direction, but you're not going to be able to superimpose them. So this molecule right here is a chiral molecule, and this carbon is a chiral center. So this carbon is a chiral is a chiral carbon, sometimes called an asymmetric carbon or a chiral center. It, sometimes you'll hear something called a stereocenter. A stereocenter is a more general term for any point in a molecule that is asymmetric relative to the different groups that is joined to. But they, all of these, especially you know when you're kind of in introductory uh, organic chemistry class, tends to be a carbon bonded to four different groups. And I want to make that, st I want to stress that it's not four different atoms. You could have had a methyl group here and a propyl group here, and the, the carbon would still be bonded directly to a carbon in either case, but that would still be a chiral carbon, and this would still actually be a chiral molecule. In the next video, we'll do a bunch of, uh, a bunch of examples, but we'll look at molecules, try to identify the chiral carbons, and then try to figure out whether the molecule itself is also chiral. Well, that was a very, very nicely done um, uh, rendition of chirality and handedness. And I thought that you would like that because it looks a little bit better than, uh, or a little bit different than the way I was explaining it. Um, so chirality is also known as handedness. Um, and the criterion for chirality is, uh, of a molecule is that it cannot be superimposed um, on its mirror image. So a chiral molecule is one which exists in two forms, both with the same molecular formula, but differing in arrangements of bonds, resulting in a non-superimposable mirror image for the second molecule. The best example of chirality is human hands, like um, the uh, guy who just showed us on the video. Uh, the left hand is non-superimposable mirror image of the right hand, and no matter how the two hands are oriented, it is absolutely impossible for all the major features of both hands to coincide at the same time. You can't shake the right hand of somebody using the, the left hand. You can't do that. Um, the difference in symmetry becomes immediately obvious at that time. And why do we have this um, uh, handedness of, in humans? It's because of when we're born, uh, there's unequal distribution of fine motor skills. So um, it just is, is something that we grow up with, but we're not going to really um, discuss that. Whoopsie, discuss that at this time because it has nothing to do with bonds. But you might think that uh, chirality is just, you know, it's this concept, oh my gosh, um, very highbrow. Uh, but no, almost all living organisms contain only left-handed amino acids and right-handed sugars. So in a mixture, of, so every mixture of amino acids ha will have both left and right-handed amino acids, um, you know, in equal proportions. But uh, life will always prefer to, to suck up the left-handed amino acids, and it will ignore the right-handed amino acids because we can't use them. We can't break those bonds. And as, curiously, life will just use the right-handed sugars and ignore the left-handed sugars because we don't have the mechanism to break those down. So this exclusive one-handedness means proteins, and also DNA would be chiral because DNA has... Um, sugars attached to it, which are then therefore right-handed. Um, and the proteins are would be left-handed amino acids. So there's chirality in DNA also. Um, so molecular chirality, whoopsie, I don't know why it keeps saying this. Um, molecular chirality results from one degree or another of twisting within a mole molecular structure, whereby a turn to the left can be distinguished from a turn to the right. So two mirror images of a chiral molecule are called enantiomers um, from enantiomorphs or opposite shape. Uh, many organic molecules are chiral, which means they are different from the mirror image molecules, just like a left and a right hand glove are. And life is made largely of molecules that are different from their mirror image. Um, the DNA double helix, for instance, always twists like a right-handed screw. 
not like a left-handed one. And molecules that are identical to their mirror images are called achiral. So what is an achiral object? An achiral object will have something that has no handedness to it. Um, so that means you, you, you can superimpose it all day long, and uh, it will work. Um, like a plain baseball bat, if there's no writing on it. Or a plain round ball, if there's no seams that you can see. Or a plain pencil. Or a nail. Or a piece of blank paper. Um, there's nothing in there that you can superimpose that all day long, and it, it will work. So that's achiral. That's something called achiral, not chiral. Whoopsie, whoopsie. That went too fast. Um, and chirality is not restricted just to molecules. It's everywhere. So let's look at this, uh, this link, which I think is uh, really cool because it shows you this property. Uh, there's no no sound to it, which, which is fine because I can yak all I want. Um, human hands are mirror images of each other, and uh, here's a picture of uh, human hands: left hand, and the right hand. And uh, then what we have is um, objects that are non-superimposable. Uh, mirror images are called chiral, and so our hands are an example of chirality. But objects that are superimposable. Uh, and they're called achiral. So achiral objects would be like a beer bottle. We can superimpose it all day long. We can do that. We can uh, do that. Um, so molecules can also be non-superimposable uh, on each other. And um, here they took some, uh, um, it looks like, um, I don't know, uh, marshmallows that they colored. And they took uh, some pieces of sticks uh, in different lengths. And uh, they made um, a carbon atom with four um, other atoms bonded to it. So the green atom points backward. But in, in uh, the other picture, it was pointing uh, the other way. So that's a mirror image, which can't be superimposed on each other. And so the atoms won't match. And so here you see, you know, it's leaning forward, whereas the other one's leaning backward. And so um, and that's why it's a mirror image. So as we try to superimpose the actual image, we see that they don't match. And the white and green atoms would be misplaced. So you try and do it. Uh, it just doesn't work. Just like the left hand will never fit into a right-handed glove. It's just not going to work, is it? So um, our bodies, uh, we talked about how proteins and sugars are chiral. Um, and uh, so they have different effects. And we looked at that in detail before. Here is uh, the image of um, uh, spearmint and uh, caraway seed. So rye bread would have caraway seed oil. Uh, spearmint gum doesn't. And so there, there's we looked at drugs. Um, some can cure, while others will cause a bad problem. So uh, that was a good one that I thought um, uh, somebody had prepared f before and uh, uh, had uh, done a pretty good job of, of uh, explaining this. And here is another one. A chiral object is one that is not superimposable on its mirror image. Your left hand is chiral. It cannot be superimposed on your right hand. Many molecules, including important drugs and natural products, are chiral. This is a ball and stick model of a carbon molecule with four different groups attached to the central carbon. For example, the four groups could be hydrogen, chlorine, methyl, and carboxylic acid. This molecule is chiral. That is, it is not superimposable on its mirror image. The two forms of a chiral molecule are called enantiomers. Using special rules, one form is labeled R, the other S. Enantiomers have mostly the same physical properties, but they behave differently in chiral environments. Molecules may contain more than one chiral center. For example, tartaric acid, which is found in many fruits and in wines, has two chiral centers. Yeah, that um, explains um, many things about, I mean, it leads into other ideas, but we're not going to go into such details. And actually, we could do a whole 
a section or a couple lectures on chirality, but we're not going to do that. We're just going to mosey on and uh, look at uh, chirality like when you go to the beach. So next time you go to the beach, look at the shells, the coiled ones. Most of them, about 90%, will be coiled on the right-hand side. Is that cool or what? Um, they're, they're called dextral the coils. Um, and then at the bottom of the screen, you see these fishes. So these are flat fishes. Um, flat fishes uh, usually like to sit at the bottom of uh, the lake, river, sea. And uh, what they do is they sit there and they blend in with the dirt um, and the sand and uh, wait for food to come by and then they'll just grab it. Um, but they lie there for so long on one side um, that the other eye that's on the other side um, will migrate to the, the top, top side um, because he needs to see better. I mean, if one eye is on the other side, he, he's losing, he can only see, you know, uh, one side. So he wants to see, um, the fish wants to see uh, his prey uh, better. So when you look at the flounder, the flounder's eyes, uh, it's always left-eyed. So the migration is always left-eyed, whereas the halibut fish also does the same idea. Uh, but he's right-eyed, so uh, he has a different, um, he lies on his right side. So that's kind of cool. And um, let's see if I can uh, get this. Oh, yeah. So uh, y if you look at the horns of uh, the gazelles or these um, sheep that have coiled horns, that's also chirality. So l the left horn is different from the right horn, and you can't superimpose it. Um, if you uh, feet, um, the, the nails, the screws on a nail, if you look at it, they're twisted one way. They're never twisted the other way. Um, chirality on, in, in uh, snail shells, you can see that over there too. And uh, the best example, um, other than hands, is um, uh, that uh, pharmaceutical companies thought that they would exploit, exploit this idea. And uh, they know that uh, life always prefers the right-handed sugars. Um, but if they put uh, left-handed sugars in the food, they would still taste sweet. However, we can't digest them. So artificial sweeteners are all left-handed sugars. And if we just lift, lived on left-handed sugars, we would starve to death because we actually do need sugar to, to I mean, it's in the DNA, it's in every, uh, every part of our body. So if we, all we had to eat was left-handed sugar, we would, we would die. Um, but um, uh, that is a great example of what happens. So um, it, and again, enantiomers, you can have a left and a right um, enantiomer, just they're like left and right hands. And uh, enantiomers are chiral molecules, they're mirror images, not superimposable on each other, and usually only one isomer is biologically active. And so uh, the smallest change can produce um, greatly different results. And here is another link that I thought was interesting. Oh, yes. Actually, it is a band, and it's called chirality, and I thought I'd bring it in just to show you that. But I can only take so much. So uh, we're not going to worry about rock and roll. Um, uh, but we are going to think, why Why does this happen? And that is because the carbon atom, uh, when it's bonded to four different atoms, loses all symmetry. So it becomes asymmetric, an asymmetric carbon atom. And the configuration of such a tetrahedron is chiral then. And so the structure can exist either in a right-hand configuration or a left-hand configuration. So if it does, then one is the mirror image of the other. And this type of configurational isomerism is called enantiomorphism. Um, and the non-identical mirror image pairs of isomers are therefore called enantiomers. And we need to talk about the enantiomers a little bit more because these are fascinating compounds. These are um, exploited by the pharmaceutical company because two enantiomers of a drug can have completely different effects. Usually, only one isomer is biologically active and the other one is a dud. So um, this shows that the organism is very finely tuned, it's very finely honed to um, the compound being have, having even the smallest variation in its molecules. Uh, again, remember, 
the mo the formula is the same. It's just the configuration in space of where those atoms went to. So, for instance, if you look at the drug ibuprofen, which everybody knows reduces pain, um, its effective enantiomer is S ibuprofen, but the ineffective enantiomer is R ibuprofen. And you notice um, it's the left handed molecule that actually works rather than the right handed. However, if you look in um, albuterol, which uh, is given to asthma patients, and um, the effective enantiomer is the R albuterol. So the right-handed enantiomer in this case is actually effective, not the left-handed one. Um, distinctive properties of organic molecules depend on the carbon skeleton and on the chemical groups attached to it. A number of characteristic groups can replace the carbons. So we're always thinking of the perfect molecule being methane because carbon is in the center and there are four hydrogen atoms around it and each one is pulling equally on uh, the electrons and it's a perfectly symmetrical molecule. However, if we start replacing those hydrogens with some other groups, um, we can make different organic molecules. So. We have, uh, for example, um, two hormones, estradiol and testosterone. They both have uh, a common carbon skeleton, both have four fused rings, but they only differ in the chemical groups attached to the rings of the carbon skeleton, like this. So on the left-hand side, you have estradiol, and the right-hand side, you have testosterone. And notice that the methyl group um, it, there's an extra methyl group in the testosterone um, than compared to the estradiol, and uh, there is um, a, a double bonded oxygen in testosterone, whereas estradiol has an OH group, an extra one. So the functional groups are the components of organic molecules that are most commonly involved in the chemical reactions. And the number and arrangement of functional groups gives each molecule its unique properties. The seven most important functional groups um, in the chemistry of life are the hydroxyl group, very important, that's OH, carbonyl group, carboxyl group, amino group, sulfhydryl group, phosphate group, and methyl group. And we're going to look at each of them separately. So here is a table showing all those groups that we were just talking about um, in the list. So the hydroxyl group is on the top, and you can see it has a red oxygen molecule and one hydrogen attached to it. So the other um, valency is free, and that will be attached to the carbon. And if you get a carboxyl group attached to a carbon skeleton that has three other um, hydrogen, you end up with an alcohol uh, called ethanol. If you have a carbonyl group, and that would be um, one carbon double bonded with one oxygen, um, and again, if you look at the uh, uh, picture on the very right-hand side, what you see is three carbon atoms, and they're all paired up with, with oxygen atoms, except for the center one, and that one uh, has a double bond with oxygen and it's called acetone. However, if you move that double bond to the edge, then uh, you don't get acetone. In fact, you get propanol. Um, carboxyl group is the next. So carboxyl will be um, carbon with two oxygens um, and actually uh, one hydrogen, but the hydrogen is part of the oxygen group. So it's an OH group uh, bonded to the carbon and double bonded with one oxygen. So you end up with an acid, um, a carboxylic acid or acetic acid, and that is shown in um, the depiction on the right hand side. The amino group would be something that has nitrogen in it, and the nitrogen is depicted with the blue ball, and the two white balls are again. 
um, what you end up with is an amine or an amino acid. So you end up with the simplest amino acid, which is glycine. And here you see two carbons. Um, and uh, instead of one oxygen, one hydrogen, it is bonded to an amino group, which is NH2. Um, and instead, and the, the other um, bonds are with hydrogen, except um, the carbon on the edge has a double bond with oxygen, and uh, then it has a single bond with uh, OH. So you get glycine, which is the simplest amino acid. And glycine is actually present in the interstellar medium, too. So it's present in space. And the next group is the sulfhydro group. So the big yellow ball in the center is actually supposed to be sulfur. And again, the little white ball is hydrogen. And when you attach that to a carbon-carbon backbone, you get a thiol, like cysteine. Cysteine also happens to be an amino acid. Um, and then you have the phosphate group. The phosphate group is very, very important. Um, so what you have here is one phosphorus. It's a light yellow ball, and it's attached to three oxygen. One of the oxygens is double bonded, um, and you end up with an organic phosphate, like glycerol phosphate. Um, or you could uh, that would be uh, some sort of uh, fatty acid. Um, the last one is the methyl group, and you have uh, the big black ball, which represents carbon, and three hydrogens, so you get a methylated compound, um, for instance, 5-methylcytosine. Um, this happens to be a ring compound, and you notice that there is um, CH3, which is the methyl group, um, attached to one of the carbons. So if you look at that carbon, um, all four bonds are made. It has one single bond with methyl, one single bond with carbon, and two double bonds with the next carbon. So it's satisfied. Just a very stable compound. Um, since that picture was kind of squished, we're going to look at it like this, break it up into half, so it's a little bit easier to look at. Um, hydroxyl group will give us an alcohol, like ethanol. A carbo carbonyl group will give us an, uh, a ketone or an aldehyde. A carboxyl group will give us an organic acid, like acetic acid. And an amino group will give us an amino acid. Um, and uh, what we see in uh, the hydroxyl group, for instance, we can write it like this, um, as depicted, but it is a polar compound due to the electro electronegativity of oxygen, and it forms hydrogen bonds with water. Okay, um, The carbonyl group, the distinction of this is it... it um, uh, these sugars that have ketone groups, they're called ketoses. Those with aldehyde groups are called aldoses. And uh, you end up with um, ketones or aldehydes. And the carboxyl group um, gives us acids. And um, what you get is, uh, is an organic acid um, acetic acid uh, comes to mind, which is one of the simpler ones. It gives vinegar its sour taste, uh, and that's how we know it generally. It's a weak acid, um, but that's uh, what the carboxyl group does. It adds, um, it acts like an acid. The amino group uh, has the nitrogen group in it, and this acts like a base, and uh, you end up with amino acids. Um, the second half of that original graph, or original table, has the sulfhydro group, which gives us thiols, the phosphate group, which gives us organic phosphates, the methyl group, which methylates any compound. Um, and uh, when we look at a sulfhydro group, um, these are very important because uh, the sulfur will bond with another sulfur, sulfur uh, or another sulfur of another sulfhydro group, and it will become a cross-linked um, cross linkage, 
which is stabilizes the uh, compound. Usually, you find these sulfur bridges in in uh, proteins. Um, the phosphate group. So when it is attached, it gives the uh, molecule the ability to react with water, um, uh, which will release energy. So like adenosine triphosphate, that's what it does. And the methyl group actually affects the expression of genes. Um, and so um, what we end up with are methylated compounds, um, and these affect the shape and the function of a lot of things, including uh, the uh, sex hormones. ATP is an amazing, amazing compound. It's really important because it, it is the currency of life. It, it uh, is what all life uses um, to get energy from. The energy is trapped in a bond, which is released when ATP hydrolyzes and becomes ADP, and a bunch of energy is given off. So um, ATP, also known as adenosine triphosphate, it has an organic molecule called adenosine, and it's attached to a string of three phosphate groups. And it sort of looks like this. So um, that is how it reacts with water. And you end up with a release of energy and ADP, or adenosine diphosphate.